During the peak of Prohibition, American cities were ruled by ruthless criminal organizations. And with the proximity to the Canadian border, one small group of Detroit street kids grew into a bootlegging gang so infamous, even Al Capone feared crossing them. But what made the Purple Gang Detroit's dominant criminal organization at the time? Find out on today's Michigan Moment. Three years before Prohibition, Michigan outlawed the sale of liquor with the Damon Act. This made Detroit a center for smuggling liquor across the border from Toledo, where it was still legal. With the adoption of the 18th Amendment in 1920, virtually all alcohol sales, possession, and manufacturing were outlawed nationwide. This turned Detroit bootleggers east across the river to Windsor, Canada, for their smuggling needs. The city quickly became a major point of trafficking alcohol into the United States. During this time, the future Purple Gang founders, brothers Abe Joe, Raymond, and Izzy Bernstein were just delinquent students at Detroit's Bishop School. The Bernstein brothers were American-born sons of Jewish immigrants from Russia. They moved from New York to Detroit's Lower East Side, an area known as Little Jerusalem back then. Here, they started as petty thieves, but soon the Bernsteins and company graduated to armed robbery and truck hijacking under the tutelage of Detroit mobsters Charles Leader and Henry Shore. The gang quickly gained notoriety through hijacking of illegal liquor shipments. There's no confirmed origin of the name Purple Gang. Now, some say it comes from a purple sweater worn by a fellow member. Others say it comes from the Purple Line Cab Company, who aligned with the gang to win a trade war. One of the more popular stories comes from an anecdote about an exchange between two Detroit shopkeepers, one of which said in regards to the gang that they weren't like other kids their age, that they were tainted or off color. The other shopkeeper agreed, calling them purple, like the color of rotten meat. Regardless of the name's origin, the Purple Gang garnered a truly rotten reputation. It's estimated that by the mid-20s, the gang was responsible for over 500 murders. At this time, they controlled most of the city's 25,000 speakeasies, which generated an annual income of more than $300,000, making bootlegging Detroit's second largest industry just behind the auto industry. All the while, the gang remained almost invincible against law enforcement, since witnesses were too frightened to testify in criminal trials. By the 1930s, the Purple Gang began to lose prominence. Intergang strife and competition had undermined the gang's authority. In September of 1931, the gang's leaders invited members Herman, or Jaime Paul, Isidore, or Joe Sutker, and Joe Lebowitz to a kind of peace negotiation to remedy intergang tensions. But when these three members arrived at the Collingwood Manor apartment building, they were all shot dead. After the shooting, Saul Levine, the driver who unknowingly transported the three men to their deaths, was later caught by Detroit police and pressured into testifying. Levine's testimony resulted in convictions for the men involved with the murders. Three of the four men, including the Purple Gang founder Ray Bernstein, were convicted of murder in the third degree and received life sentences. This event, now infamously known as the Collingwood Manor Massacre, marked the downfall of Detroit's Purple Gang. And by 1935, the gang was mostly dissolved. With 18 of its members dead and others in prison, the gang no longer reigned over Detroit's underworld. Thank you for watching this episode. If you'd like to know more about Michigan, leave a comment, and we'll see you next time on Michigan Moment.